Mr Mikado, when you first entered Parliament in 1945, you were one of more than 20 Jewish Labour MPs. At that time, there wasn't a single Jewish Conservative MP taking the party whip. Why was there this very strong identification between British Jews and socialism? Oh, well, it was largely because of the big immigration between round about 1880 and round about 1907 or 8. The, there were about, as nearly as one can calculate, about 150,000 people who emigrated from Eastern Europe and into Great Britain. A larger number, of course, went to the United States. Some went to Great Britain, came to Great Britain and went on to the States. Some came to Great Britain and went on to South Africa, where most of those came back. Um, but there remained about 150,000, the great majority of them in London. Nearly all of them landed at the port of London. Immigrants tend to settle down near the points where they land. Most of them landed, as my father did, in London docks. A few who landed in the Humber ports, in Hull notably, moved westwards to Leeds and then on to Manchester and on to Liverpool. A smaller number who landed in Leith moved westwards into Glasgow, but the great majority were in the East End of London. Now, why were they of the left? They were, on the whole, their leftism was anti-establishment. They came from a society in which they were oppressed. That's why they came. Therefore, the authorities were their enemies. And they had to overthrow the authorities. And so they were leftists, those of them who thought politically at all, in Poland and Russia, and in Bielorussia, and Lithuania, they were the main sources from which they came. Uh, they were anti-establishment. They were also, intriguingly, not only against the establishment of the Tsarist government. A lot of them were young men came coming to escape being drafted into the army because the lot of a Jew in the Tsarist army was hell, absolute hell. Um, so they were against the Tsarist establishment, but a lot of them, intriguingly, were also against the Jewish establishment. They were against the rabbis and the lay leaders, to a very large extent. So, in, in a sense, it was a sort of ragtag and bobtail leftist movement. It wasn't what we would call now a disciplined socialist oh, movement no, at all. No, not not at all. Um, they. It was. Ragtag and Bob Dow is a good description. They were odds and ends. They were odd people. They were individuals or twos and threes or sixes and sevens at most. There was no organisation at all. But they all had this thing in common that they suffered from the activities of government and therefore they were anti-government and therefore they wanted change. And that meant in the Jewish pale in Eastern Europe uh, being left because all the anti-government activities were socialist activities um, of one sort or another, varying sorts. But they were just anti-establishment. The, the thing I just mentioned is quite significant. They were anti their own establishment, anti the rabbis and the lay leaders of the community. It's fascinating that nearly all Yiddish literature is about honest proletarians getting the better of their bosses. Really is class literature and the first ever song of the class struggle and the best song still to this day of the class struggle, better than the wobbly songs and the pins and needles songs, is a Yiddish song. So that's how it was. There they were, they came here and uh, they quickly fell into the stream of those who were here already and who were anti-establishment. There was another factor too. There was, of course, a settled Jewish community, not very large, most of whom had come over in the mid-17th century when Oliver Cromwell 
repealed the edict of Edward I that barred Jews from Great Britain. A lot of them were people in the court of King Charles II before he was king, when he was an exiled prince in Holland. And he had a lot of Jewish friends, a lot of Jewish aides, and they came over. Some of those, not many, were proletarians and settled in the east end of London and, I don't know why, but there it was, in Shepherd's Bush. Gold Hawk Road was a thriving area of Sephardic Jews, the Dutch Jews, the Dotschkes, as the later incomers used to call them. But out of those, of course, arose the families of the princes of Anglo Jewry, the Montefiores and the Rothschilds and the Sassoons and the rest of them. Now these were people from whom the poor immigrants from Eastern Europe could have expected a lot of help and succour. They got some paternalistic charity from them, to be fair. But on the whole, the settled English, wealthy, conservative Jews, a lot of conservative members of parliament amongst them, they were, at that time, of course, there were no Labour members of Parliament, and the Jewish members of Parliament were all Conservatives, and on the whole right-wing Conservatives too. They resented the inflow of this proletarian, unlettered mob, as they would think of it, from Eastern Europe, and weren't at all helpful. The Chief Rabbi, Adler, when there was a strike and, uh, amongst the Jewish tailors and they went to him to appeal for help, sided with the bosses and not with the workers. Now that too created a great deal of anti-right feeling amongst people in the East End. You've made clear in your autobiography that your political development happened in the East End, although you were brought up, brought up in, in Portsmouth, in the East End between the wars. And that was a period when there was a strong revolutionary movement, particularly among Jews. The Communist Party was very, very strong. There were communist councillors in Stepney. Uh, there were communists active in, in, uh, in strikes, in, uh, in rent reduction campaigns, in a whole host of areas. Why then did you personally plump for the, the Labour Party rather than the Communist Party? I, I think because what started my thinking about politics was Toynbee. And Toynbee, Toynbee anchored me into democratic socialism. And I read quite a lot of political philosophy, even as a kid, as a young teenager. I must have been a horror, really. Um, and I developed the feeling early on, I became a socialist very early, but I developed the feeling early on that yeah, wasn't any socialism without democracy, and there wasn't any democracy without socialism. So I was never attracted to communism at all, at all, at all. There were three main threats in the East End of the period that you're talking about. There were the communists, and they were strong in the ways that you mentioned. There were communist councillors, there were also Labour councillors, of course, in Stepney. There were, there were the communists, there were the people who joined the Labour Party, largely by starting out as trade unionists and building trade unions. Um, and quite strong trade unions for the size of the community. Eventually they were absorbed in the wider trade union movement, but they, I mean, they really were the founders of the, furniture, the present furniture trade union, the founders of the tailors and garment workers, the London Jewish Bakers Union went on to even well after the Second World War. I think its last affiliation of the TUC was 13 members. My wife's uncle was for a time General Secretary of the London, before she was my wife, before I knew her, of the London Jewish Bakers Union. He didn't have a surname. He was called Moshe Becker, Moses the Baker, that was the only surname he had. <laughs> it was very funny. 
he complained bitterly that he had all this vast area to cover, all the way from the old gate pump to Mile End, and the union wouldn't allow him to have a motor car. Uh, that, that, so they started the unions, they built the unions, they cooperated a lot with the general unions, the non-Jewish unions. I think the real, the thing that contributed most to a link between the two was the fact that during the dock strike, the major dock strike, just about a century ago now, isn't it? The Jews took in hundreds of strikers' children to look after them so that they wouldn't suffer while their dads were on strike. Um, they built the unions, and through the unions, I think, got into the Labour Party. And they became a very considerable influence in the Labour Party of the East End. Indeed, when I was first adopted as MP for Poplar in 63, Poplar wasn't the Jewish part of the East End, and not in considerable part of my management committee was consisted of Jews. They were Jews and the descendants of Irish. I used to smile when they called the role of the management committee. There were all these cockneys and a quarter of the names that were read out were Jewish names and more than a half were Flaherty and Brannigan and Halligan and Connolly and O'Connor and the rest. Cockneys with huge Cockney accents who never set eyes on Ireland in their lives, who were third, second, third, fourth generation descendants, had nothing left of their Irishness except their names and their religion, their Catholicism. So there was still Jewish influence there in the Stepney constituency, of course, there were far more Jews. But it was a vanishing asset as the younger ones moved out and left the older ones behind. How much did Israel count as a focus of support for Labour? Because Labour, certainly during the wartime years, came out strongly in support of Israel. It didn't quite follow that through in office. But in the 45 election, did you get, or did, did Labour candidates get a lot of Jewish votes because they were pro-Israel? No, I don't think so. I don't think so at that time. Not in 45. In the 30s, it was a very considerable influence. <coughs> the Balfour Declaration <coughs> meant a lot to the Jews of the East End. They went on reciting their prayer, which the Jews had recited through 2,000 years. Next year in Jerusalem, they felt a very strong lead a uh, very strong um, feeling of tie to the, before the foundation of the state, to the issue of the Jewish settlement in Palestine. They collected pennies and sent money and they carried out pro-Zionist activities and then when the state was founded there came some great Philip that increased their morale, but that was after the war. But in the 30s, while the struggles were going on, the Balfour Declaration meant a lot to the Jews. And it, it was one of the things that changed the attitude, the political attitudes of Jews. Now Labour, as you say, was always strongly in favour of the Jewish settlement and of Israel, right up to three, four years ago. It's only very recent times that that tide has turned. And that certainly had an influence. I am not sure it had much influence in 1945. Why has this association, epitomised by the 45 election result, between Anglo Jewry and the political left, now all but disappeared? After all, there are now twice as many Jewish Conservative MPs as Labour MPs. Ah, you shouldn't judge it by the number of Conservative MPs and Labour MPs, because there's a special reason for that which I'll come to in a minute. Um, what you should judge it by is the fact that the, whilst the majority of Jews in 1945, and I would think in 50 and 51 and 55 and 59 voted Labour, since then there's been a considerable shift over to the Tories. And I'm afraid the explanation is a crude 
basic simple one, it is the rise of yappydom. The Jews have more than their fair share of yappies. And they have moved over in the way that a lot of non-Jews have moved over. I mean, it is a characteristic, isn't it, of our society that the children of regular Labour voters and Labour supporters and Labour members have moved over. And it's happened to Jews as it's happened to non-Jews. Do you think there is still an identifiable Jewish vote, a Jewish political affiliation? I never thought there was an identifiable Jewish vote at any time. Um, just as I don't think, contrary to what most people imagine, that there's an identifiable Roman Catholic vote. They are both class votes. Working class Catholics vote Labour, middle and upper class Catholics vote Tory, working class Jews vote Labour, middle and upper class Jews vote Liberal or Tory or what have you. No, I don't think there is an identifiable Jewish vote. I'm glad there isn't. There ought not to be. People ought not to vote on that sort of basis. I think we are now under threat of an identifiable Muslim vote. And I don't think it's awfully healthy. I'm glad there isn't an identifiable Jewish vote. But the disappearance of the Jewish working class tradition, the disappearance of the Jewish working class environment, after all, the East End is, is no longer Jewish in any recognisable sense. I think there's only one synagogue left there, just a few bagel shops, uh, very, very few Jewish tailoring establishments. Do you rejoice in that as a sign that uh, the Jewish communities put that behind them, or do you regret that? Well, both. I rejoice that the Jewish community, like a lot of other people, have got out of the uh, proletarian grindstone, got away from the treadmill. Of course I rejoice in that. But it is a pity that the proletarian tradition, not only amongst Jews but amongst others as well, all this is the product of the decline of the manufacturing base in this country in the last 10 years or more. Um, and it applies to non-Jews pretty well as much as it does to Jews. Uh, the industries which provided the proletarian-based manufacturing industry has run down to a horrendous extent. I mean, there are no real tailoring factories and tailoring workshops in the way that there were, there are furniture workshops in the way that there were. It's now no all high-tech, large-scale production. And uh, it doesn't need the skills which the Jews brought with them. But you still regard yourself, obviously, very much as Jewish, and it's an important part of you, it's an important part of your identity. Do you feel as much at home now in Golders Green or in Redbridge as you did in the old East End? Um... No, I felt very much at home in the old East End. Nevertheless, I must tell you, when I go to Redbridge, or when I go to other places, and I talk to people about the East End and their days, I'm talking to the sons and daughters, or grandsons and granddaughters, those people in the East End. They still got it. They still got the feeling. They still pay tribute to that generation of immigrants. They are still... Even the uppies, very conscious of the debt they owe to their fathers and grandfathers who came over here with, most of them would no more, like my father did, no more than the clothes he stood up in, and one Zaris ruble, two shillings, that's what he came with. I'm very conscious of the debt I owed him, I owe him, because that generation, they, they were a fabulous generation. They, made sure their kids were going to get on. They built schools. They made their synagogues. They built a London Jewish hospital on pennies. I used to go and collect pennies Sunday morning from ill-paid tailors and pressers and machinists. They were fantastic. And they made the Jews Free School, which was, I suppose, the first major comprehensive school, the biggest, one of the best there ever was. Stepney Jewish, wonderful schools. I find even the people who've got on in the world 
haven't lost their consciousness. That that's where they came from, and that's where they, that's to whom they owe what they are. But don't you find it embarrassing now that, for example, there have been a number of Jews prominent in Mrs. Thatcher's cabinets, oh, and the values that the, the I values. Forgot, yeah, I forgot something. I said earlier on, don't judge you by the number. There's a reason for that. You said in '45 there weren't any. Until only a few years ago, not many years ago, 1520, it was very difficult for any Jew to get selected as a Conservative candidate. The, you know, I studied my political career in Reading. I was told by one of the prominent Reading Conservatives that when they went to select a candidate, they were told three rules. No Catholics, no women, no Jews. And that used to run through quite a lot. Now, there's been a sort of second emancipation of the Jews in that regard. There was the emancipation in the 19th century after they were prevented from going into Parliament at all with the Catholics. And then they were emancipated then. Now, there's been a second emancipation in the Tory party, without any doubt. There's still a lot of anti-Semitism on the Conservative backbenches. And there's still a lot of Jewish conservatives who deny being Jews or who escape from being Jews. Lawson is one, Edwina Carey is one. Uh, when the row over Westland went on, I was there, I watched it, and it was between Heseltine and Britain. No doubt about the fact that a lot of the antipathy to Britain was anti Semitic. No question about it at all. And that's not the only manifestation I've seen. Nevertheless, there has been this second emancipation. So it is now easier for a Jew to get selected than it was. As for why there has been a shrinkage in the number of Labour MPs who are Jewish, it's because there's been a shrinkage in the number of Labour supporters who are Jewish. I see now a certain sign of reversal as a part of the general reversal of opinion in the country. And I've been to one or two constituencies lately with sizable Jewish electorates and I detect a, a certain swinging back. You mentioned anti-Semitism. If I can just ask you one last question. You've spent much of your very long career, distinguished career in Parliament, representing constituencies which were not largely Jewish, which didn't have a particularly sizable Jewish constituency. Did you ever encounter personally anti-Semitism from Labour supporters, from trade unions, from Labour voters? No. In my first election in 1945, there were amongst the spoiled ballot papers three across which were scrawled the words Japanese Jew. That was my first manifestation. It was three people. Um, I have not experienced anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. I won't say there isn't any anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. There is, as you know, and understandably, I think, quite a lot of anti-Zionism. And sometimes the boundary between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism gets a bit blurred. Some anti-Semites say they are anti-Zionists because they're not prepared to say they are anti-Semites. But I have never personally experienced from anybody in the Labour Party any anti-Semitism at all that I knew of. There was one bit of anti-Semitism that I didn't know of, which was, as I recounted in my memoir, that I didn't know until many years afterwards, Clement Attlee decided that he didn't want any Jews in his government. He had many Shumo, and he didn't want any more. Um, but I didn't know about that at the time. And it didn't affect me personally anyway. Well, it affected me personally in that I didn't get a job in his government. But it didn't affect me in my daily contact. I have never found anything but kindness and comradeship from members of the Labour Party and Labour voters. Of course I have been opposed at election after election by National Front candidates and I have been very anti-Semitic and said a lot of anti-Semitic things and have tried to whip up anti-Semitism against me. But one
doesn't take any notice of them. Uh, no, my answer to your question is no, I have nothing to complain about.